Um, hello, everybody. I'm Joe Lombardo. I'm uh, uh, the co-coordinator of the United National Anti-War Coalition, um, which is a member organization of the Hands Off Syria Coalition, and that's the website for the Hands Off Syria Coalition. There's some leaflets, uh, there's some literature over there on Syria and other things, um, including the statement of the Hands Off Syria Coalition, which was kind of like our founding document of what we stand for. Um, uh, I'm also on the coordinating committee of the Hands Off uh, Syria Coalition. Um, we have four panelists today. I'll introduce them um, more fully um, as I introduce each one to speak but we have uh, Tarek uh, Kauf from uh, Veterans for Peace. We have Sarah Flounders from the International Action Center. Uh, Judy Bello from uh, uh, Syria Solidarity Movement. And uh, Bayman um, Azad from uh, um, the U.S. Peace Council. So we're going to start with uh, Tarek. And Tarek Kauf was a, a U.S. Army paratrooper for three and a half years. He's on the Veterans for Peace National Board of Directors. He led veterans delegations to Ferguson, Missouri, Standing Rock, North Dakota, uh, Jaju Island in South Korea, Okinawa, and Palestine. And he is the managing editor of the Peace in Our Times, which is the Veterans for Peace quarterly newspaper, and there's copies of it over there. So we'll start with Tarek. Uh, good morning, and thanks for coming out. <clears throat> Basically, I'd just like to repeat Veterans for Peace's position on what's going on in Syria. First of all, we're aware that the United States has been for its entire history the greatest purveyor of terrorism, terrorism and war and violence, probably in the history of the world. I actually can't think of any other country that is promoted so much violence and been involved in, in creating so much violence. And we're aware that what's happening in Syria is part of the mess in the Middle East that colonial powers caused um, years ago and that the United States has been deeply involved in. We're also aware that the CIA is very, very powerfully involved in what's going on in Syria. We're aware that we're arming so-called uh, rebel groups, so-called moderate groups, <clears throat> which the moderates, the nonviolent people among them, have long since disowned because they've been taken over by violence and violent uh, groups who are waging, you know, uh, war in Syria. Uh, many of these groups are using uh, American-made weapons. Uh, we've been bombing Syria for a while and we're just contributing to the chaos and the misery and the death and destruction that's going on there. So Veterans for Peace is totally opposed to U.S. involvement in that area, except in diplomatic terms. We are demanding that um, the current idiot in the White House uh, withdraw troops. We have troops in Syria now. We have planes, uh, withdraw all of our military forces and back out of Syria and engage in diplomacy. We also insist that, um, we, let me just say, we're not taking a position one way or the other on whether Bashar Assad's government is good or bad. That's not our business. That's the business of the Syrian people. Meanwhile, it's, it's one of the only secular governments in that area and uh, we urge our government to recognize that government and deal with them diplomatically. Uh, we don't feel that the use of force or violence has, has or will um, solve anything. So our position is Veterans for Peace is get the hell out of there. Stop uh, bullshitting the public stop trying to convince the public that we are dealing with uh, some horrific uh, agents that we have to stop, that we have no alternative of stopping. Uh, people are seeing through that, and we hope that people continue to see through that lie, because it is very similar to
to many lies that this country has used to excuse wars of terror that it has waged. So as veterans who have uh, participated in, in the military, uh, sometimes in wars of aggression, we are totally opposed to this. We want peace, we want diplomacy, we want respect for elected governments, and we do not want to infer, interfere in that conflict over there, regardless of the propaganda that comes out of the government, and regardless of whether Bashar Assad is a nice guy or not a nice guy, regardless of that, American involvement only makes the situation worse, period, and always has. So that's Veterans for Peace's position. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Judith Bellow. Uh, Judith is um, a member of the uh, UNAC Administrative Committee. She's representing the Syria Solidarity Movement on the panel. Uh, she's a founding member of the Upstate New York Drone Action, which has done some incredible um, actions, uh, especially at the Hancock Drone Base, which Judy has been involved in. She's visited Syria, I think, on two occasions, and uh, she has also visited um, a number of other countries on peace delegations. Uh, this is Judy. Hi. Um, I uh, wanted to talk a little about some of the myths that the United States uses to manipulate people into uh, follow into supporting this uh, he, he and his war uh, against the people of Syria. Um, I visited Syria twice. I was an election observer in 2014, and in that particular occasion, I talked to a lot of ordinary people. I uh, went uh, spent some time in Tartus, uh, going to different election uh, places and talking to people there. And I had a, a translator they delegated to me so I could actually freely talk to people. And um, at the time, one thing that was clear was that people in general really wanted to keep Bashar Assad as their president. He, uh, for them, he represents security and a future for the country, a stable future on which they can build. So uh, we also had people at that time who went to um, Sueda and Homs, and they had the same uh, feedback. And in fact, in, um, in uh, Beirut, uh, so many uh, Syrian um, refugees converged uh, to vote in Beirut that they literally shut the city down. So uh, this was really an important, I think, pivotal moment. Um, so to get to the myths, the first is that uh, the Syrian war is a sectarian war. Well, inside Syria, it's not a sectarian war. Um, the, uh, the fact that Assad is an Alawite and nearly 80% of uh, Sunnis are Muslim, uh, uh, Muslims are Sunni, uh, is um, more or less irrelevant in this context. Syria has been home to numerous Christian and Muslim splinter groups since the time of Christ. Uh, because those religions uh, had early founding moments there, uh, you know, uh, uh, Christ was born in part of greater Syria. And um, the first, the second caliphate was also in Damascus. And all these little fragments of these religions grew up there and stayed, and they're still there. And uh, it's a very stable, ancient, multi-faith fabric in Syria. Journalists who visited there are really amazed. And uh, in like the 2006 or 8 period, a woman named Jean Marie Offenbacher made a film called Tea on the Axis of Evil, where she interviewed all these Syrians about uh, just the fact that they were happy living together and they don't talk about religion in any major way, the same as we don't here. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. This last time I was in Syria, I visited the Grand Mufti. Uh, the Grand Mufti, all Sunni, uh, largely Sunni countries have a Grand Mufti, and he's sort of in the endowed person there who can make uh, legal judgments within the uh, Islamic faith. And um, the, Grand Mufti, the current Grand Mufti of Syria, Hassan Badridin Hassoun, uh, is, says that he thinks that um, all religions should be able to coexist in peace under a secular government and that way uh, the religious communities can focus on what's important which is their faith. Um, 
The government of Bashar Assad uh, is not an Alawite government. It reflects uh, the demographics of the uh, country, as does the Syrian Arab army at this point. It's very much uh, just uh, conscripts coming from all over the country. And people at this point who are volunteering to protect their country. Um, the next myth I want to address is the Syrian people rose up against oppression. Uh, Syria is a socialist republic. It has in its constitution a mandate to provide for the needs of the people. Government provides free education and medical care, water, electricity, uh, an economic safety net for the poor, including general subsidies for bread and gasoline. Uh, the women in Syria have many rights. They're mostly well, many of them are well educated. There's no political constraints on their activities. There are conservative religious communities in Syria, like there are in this country, that constrain uh, the way women can live. But that is a different element than whether or not it's politically constrained. So you often will see a woman in a hijab and a long dress walking down the street in conversation with a woman in western style clothes and uh, you know her hair flowing down her back. It's very common. Uh, because they don't judge it. It's just the way it is. Um, so uh, the next myth I want to address briefly is that Bashar is a, Assad is a ruthless dictator and the Syrian people hate him. Uh, in fact, when he came to power, he was very, very popular. He was unanimously supported by the parliament and had a, a large majority of the people supporting him as well. Uh, in, in inheriting Syria, Bashar's trial by fire elaborate lists all his actions in the first couple years of his uh, coming in control of the country and basically he freed a gazillion prisoners. He freed a lot of prisoners that nobody knew what had ha happened to them. Uh, many of them were from the Muslim Brotherhood, a sort of longtime enemy of the Ba'ath Party. He um, opened up the universities and he brought in um, uh, high-tech uh, stuff into the universities and subjects and computer science, internet. He uh, allowed a free press to o begin and uh, a number of uh, periodicals started to arise that were not uh, controlled by the Ba'ath Party. Um, so uh, at the, in 2011, while there were uh, opposition rallies that we saw on TV here, uh, in Syria, there were also much larger rallies in support of the Syrian government, and which I might add that although they support Bashar Assad, he is not the whole Syrian government. They have a robust bureaucratic government as much as I've seen anywhere here or in Europe. They have all kinds of, uh, you know, people doing all kinds of jobs in that government uh, that are just, you know, supporting the people. Uh, in 2012, Bashar Assad met with dissidents from around the country and um, anyone who would meet with him, basically. He, they had the constitution rewritten to reflect the, uh, reflect the concerns of the people who were willing to talk to him. And he brought in Ali Haydar, the leader of a longtime left opposition party, uh, into the government as Minister of Reconciliation and began uh, creating the groundwork for the reconciliation committees they're using now. And reconciliation, it is a hard thing in the middle of a knockdown, drag out war because they have to draw the people off who don't want to fight anymore from those who will, you know, who are foreigners or who will fight to the death for uh, whatever they're thinking about. So uh, there's no reason, though, to think that uh, in 2014, um, Assad was elected by a great majority, as I talked about when I introduced myself. Uh, he was very popular because the people want their country back. Uh, another thing that I uh, need to mention is that two-thirds of the Syrian people are still in the government-held areas, including uh, the great majority of the refugees. So uh, everyone wants the protection of having a government. And Assad is more or less the symbol of that government because this war is a war that's attacking civilization in Syria. So uh, another myth I want to get to quickly is that the war began with peaceful protests. In Daraa, where the war infamously began with a civilian massacre, we're told, it was later noted that more police and soldiers were killed than civilians. Uh, a huge stockpile of weapons uh, was found in the central mosque there and it was guarded by foreign jihadis who had come up from Libya through Jordan. Um, in a town, a, a border town of Turkey called Jizr al-Shugar, Islamist fighters 
uh, trained in Turkey, uh, sent their families over to a camp where I might end, they still live uh, across the border in Turkey. And um, they called for help to the Syrian military and they, uh, when the soldiers arrived, they killed them all. And um, what's happening now in Jesus al Sugar is that uh, it's physically in ruins and it's inhabited by 200,000 Asian jihadis and their families from Uyghurs and people really from the Far East and uh, who are looking for a place where they can have an Islamist community, uh, which isn't really welcome in China. Um, so uh, as far as, no one I met in Syria thought of, there were moderate uh, rebels. Uh, everyone had a horror story to tell about someone they loved being killed, being threatened, uh, just horror stories that I can't even begin to tell you. Uh, the one uh, people having their food, uh, being denied food and medical access, children being shot in the street for laughing at a bad joke, just uh, women being stripped and flogged in public for not having a hijab on, just horrific stories that went on and on. And the one I'm going to repeat to you is Edward Dark, uh, a correspondent from Aleppo, who initially supported the revolution, changed his mind when the jihadis got there in 2013 because they came into the town and they started, besides the, all the things that I just listed and being ruthlessly killing Christians and Alawites in the street and so on, they also, uh, they went into the most prosperous uh, district in all of Syria where all of the factories are and where a lot of the wealth of the country comes from. They dismantled the factories and they shipped all the machinery up to Turkey. Mm -hmm and then they burned the buildings and smashed them and bombed them. So they destroyed uh, the one source of wealth in the country. And one of the things that was there actually was the last flooring factory in uh, uh, Syria, which uh, might throw some light on all of a sudden there are all these chemical attacks of chlorine. Um, so a last, uh, so I don't overrun my time here, uh, the last thing I'll talk about is the myth that the U.S. isn't, you know, we're just observing this, this isn't, we're not really doing this. Um, shortly after Bashar Assad came to power, George Bush placed Syria on the axis of evil and implemented severe sanctions against Syria, economic sanctions. Uh, in 2008, it was documented they were looking for ways uh, to create more dissidents in Syria. In 2010, uh, Ambassador Ford went to Syria and started meeting uh, with all kinds of revolutionaries, including uh, the, primarily the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, which is a very right-wing uh, religious organization. Uh, the U.S. and U.S. allies uh, have supplied weapons and training and political support consistently to uh, uh, militant mercenaries and terrorists in Syria. And uh, they have supplied tons and tons of cash to our allies. Uh, and meanwhile, they're enforcing draconian <coughs> sanctions on the government and the people who actually live in Syria and want to keep their lives. Uh, the United States with Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar have waged a relentless propaganda war against the Syrian government through international satellite TV stations. And that impresses the people in Syria as well as outside of Syria because they hear all these rumors. You know, they hear there's a war on, they hear that democracy and freedom are suddenly going to get better. They hear all kinds of craziness. So while the Western uh, press is screaming Assad must go and the barrel bomb murderer, uh, the Arabic language channels are calling for genocide against Alawites and Christians coming out of Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar. So uh, under the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood has many immigrants in the U.S which formed the nucleus of the Syrian National Council. These people came here after a violent insurrection in Syria in the 80s that failed. Uh, they killed all of the uh, officials in the city of Hama and took over. And uh, so the Syrian army went in a sort of infamous moment and took the city back, uh, also using violence. Uh, but at any rate, they came here and they've been waiting. And they have, the, they are not interested in democracy and freedom, though. This war is about power. It's about power for the Muslim Brotherhood, power for Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Uh, they want a right-wing theocratic state governed by laws that were new 1,500 years ago, and men who want power now. 
Uh, recently, these men have been replaced, first by the most rapacious militias operating in concert with Al-Qaeda and ISIS in Syria. They're going to the meetings and they're being put forward as future rulers of Syria, kind of like the militants in uh, Libya right now, who are at each other's throats. Uh, the U.S. has made promises all around. The statement <coughs> Assad must go is a promise that the U.S. will ensure the ultimate success of this war to undermine the Syrian Republic and destroy the infrastructure of that state. Recent moves by the U.S. to directly occupy parts of eastern Syria with a Kurdish army are evidence that the U.S. is continuing to move forward with this plan and that um, they don't change their plans ever, they only change their proxies. So uh, what they have in eastern <coughs> Syria is a mixture of ISIS and Kurds through which they hope to govern uh, an occupied territory. Thank That's you. Statement. Our next speaker is Bachman uh, Aziz. Um, he is uh, on the executive board and organizational secretary of the U.S. Peace Council. He's the NGO representative to the United Nations from the World Peace Council. He's chair of the Iran Working Group of Veterans for Peace. He's a professor of economics and sociology, and he's on the coordinating committee of the Hands Off Syria Coalition. Thank you, Joe, and thank you all for from Syria. Uh, I think Judy gave you a full picture of uh, what is going on inside and what the agents and, and, and activists or uh, actors are on, on both sides. I want to go a step further beyond that and put it in a context, a broader context. Um, the question is, <coughs> what is the root cause of this, this whole, whole um, tragedy that is going on? And it is not just in Syria. We have seen it in very many different places. And the problem is that our movement, our peace movement, a great part of it, not all of them, of course, not us, have been reactive. They wait until the war starts and they try to protest uh, without analyzing um, what is the cause so that they can be preemptive before the next one occurs. And the reason for that, um, in our understanding, in the Peace Council's understanding, is that the U.S. imperialism, and I will use that word, although many people hesitate to do that, I think uh, it's important to understand it. It's a key concept in this, that we are not dealing with different administrations, different policies. We are not dealing with different countries, different cases. We are not dealing with different evil uh, leaders all over the place, each one separate from each other. Um, we have been reacting to case by case by case. And the whole thing is started, I, I would say, after the, co the dismantling of the USSR and the drive that started on the part of Western imperialism uh, to take the full control of, of the globe, especially take over the parts of the globe that was under the influence of the Soviet Union. And that triggered a process that was pretty much formulated by um, people in the project for the New American Century in early 1990s, <coughs> 94, actually, they put out the document. And these people became later on members of the Bush administration and implemented the policy, which was uh, based on a document, 90-page document. It's online. You, you can look at it, Project for the American Century, and look for the rebuilding America's, of rebuilding America's def defenses for the 21st century or for the uh, uh, current century. And, and they outline uh, over there in that document exactly what has been going on. That is before 2000. Exactly what has been going on ever since. And I want to go over some of these, these terms before I get to my discussion um, about what what I'm focusing on. I'm quoting here. Um, I have, you know, extracted a few paragraphs out of the 90-page document. It starts by saying that the United States must shape a new century favorable to American interests. That's the assumption. At present, the United States forces uh, faces no global rival. Therefore, 
There are, however, potentially powerful states dissatisfied with the current situation and eager to change it. Um, our defense strategy must be maintaining U.S. preeminence, precluding the rise of a great power rival. And we know is they specifically mention China as that emerging rival. Today, the military's task is to expand the zone of democratic peace, military expanding the zone of democratic peace, uh, to deter the rise of a new great power competitor. On the basis of that, they advocate the dispatching of concentrating U.S. naval forces around China, East Asia. And they are starting doing that. They have done that already. Um, it is, another side of it, it is important that NATO not be replaced by European Union leaving United States without a voice in the European security affairs, which involves this whole new Ukraine issue and everything else that, that was um, another s source of conflict. It is now commonly understood that there are forces that may threaten America's ability to exercise its dominant military power. Potential rivals such as China are anxious to exploit the situation, while adversaries like Iran, Iraq, and North Korea are rushing to develop ballis ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons as a deterrent to American intervention in the region. They are not being aggressive. They themselves concede that these are defensive mechanisms being uh, created to deter U.S. from intervention. Okay. If an American peace is to be maintained and expanded, it must have a secure foundation on unquestioned U.S. military preeminence. Okay. Um, then they go on to list some of these countries that are really in the in the in the crosshairs for for putting them down or, or dividing them or subduing them. And I mentioned North Korea, Iran, Iraq, Libya, and Syria. And I, I, as if you remember Wesley Clark, the former member, uh, head of NATO, commander of NATO, mentioned seven countries uh, that were on the list. These are the objectives. That is for total domination and U.S. hegemony over the whole, whole globe. And this is why it's going on. But the way they present it, they have put it in the context of a humanitarian imperialist strategy, that they are going there to save people from dictators, from violations of human rights, to support women and liberate women as they did in Afghanistan, uh, and all kind of causes like this. And who are the people who are doing this to, to these innocent people? Are these demonic leaders? So if you go through the whole situation since the collapse of Soviet Union up to the present, you will see that each one of them will justify the invasions, attacks, military um, interference were all justified in the name of a, an evil or, 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 or bad dictator or a bad guy. Yugoslavia, Milosevic, Panama, Noriega, Afghanistan, the Taliban, Iran, the Ayatollah, Iraq, Saddam Hussein, Libya, Gaddafi, Syria, Assad, Venezuela, Chavez, and ha now Maduro, um, Ukraine, Yanukovych, Russia, Putin, now, right? Demonization is going on and on. And, and this is the, always the main justification for implementing this general strategy, that is the total domination, and is stopping any rival from emerging after the Soviet Union was gone. <coughs> now, there is two parts to this, this uh, whole demonization strategy. Uh, one is to distract people and present it as, as something good, right? When you invade another country in the name of putting, bringing down a, a, a kind of a brutal dictator, you look good. So it doesn't become an issue for the public. That demonization also pacifies the peace movement. Because we have heard in Syria when we've been defending, the, the, I mean, opposing Syrian intervention, many of the even very prominent peace organizations in the U.S. are talking about both sides are bad. We cannot take sides. That is because that whole imperialist context is missing. They look at each case individually. 
and they are taken by the propaganda, demonization propaganda, that uh, it was in 1975 when I was a student and Mike Wallace in a 60 minute program at that time mentioned that we can create enemy number one of any country's leader in two weeks. We have reached that level of media technology that we can do it. Before we invaded Iraq, the p many people didn't know where Iraq was, but didn't know who Saddam Hussein was, right? And I many of these leaders, two far a month or two months prior to the attack, people didn't know who they were, right? But in two months, they are the enemy number one, depending on who's on the agenda, right? So what they do, they pacify through this, the, 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 the peace movement. Uh, we have heard this about Syria more, more uh, you know, uh, commonly. Both sides are bad. Assad is brutal, and we don't support the State Department, so we're sitting on the fence doing nothing. Okay, <coughs> that's one side of it. The second side is probably more sinister, and that is this demonization is actually masking the fact that all these attacks are linked, part and parcel of the same imperialist strategy. By focusing on the leader as if it's just this particular leader, the cause of this invasion, that particular leader as the cause of the other invasion, right? They distract people from the scheme that is guiding and driving the whole thing. And they are taking them one by one as according to a given plan that they themselves have already outlined. And this has been going on, and this is what is going on right now. Okay. And I think this is what we, a great weakness in our peace movement, um, that it does not recognize the imperialist context of this that is going on. And they are going against aggression, but not against imperialism. Because when you go against aggression, they are dealing with each case of aggression separately, right? Unless you see that it's done for the same purpose everywhere. And it's the same force with the same intentions that are doing it. So we should really focus on bringing the whole anti-imperialist orientation to our peace movement. Because unless we do that, we will not be able to counter what is going on and, and prevent the future ones that are coming. And we think they are coming. Um, I mean, they are getting involved in Venezuela right now. They're trying to bring that government down. And um, that was my, my two cents about the situation. Thank you. Our last but not least speaker is Sarah Flounders. Sarah is the coordinator of the International Action Center. She's a member of the uh, Administrative Committee of the United National Anti-War Coalition, UNAC. She's a member of the Coordinating Committee of the Hands Off Syria Coalition. She has been on a number of trips to Syria. She's the author of several books and pamphlets, Sarah. In this program today, this panel of Hands Off Syria, uh, as Joe said, I, I've traveled to Syria uh, in delegations to, to bring others, to report back, to make videos uh, during the war. And in an earlier time when there were major international Palestine conferences in Syria, uh, you could see a very different view of what Syria was as a modern secular state so much linked to the region and to the world. So before 2011, you would have seen a totally different and secular progressive state than what you see today where a third of the population are displaced, are refugees. And yet overwhelmingly, it is a government in Syria that is providing for people. Every single school, every community building, a, a room like this classroom will house a family or two families. And yet there aren't homeless people in the streets with a third of the population displaced. So you see two very different views of Syria. And I, I want to say the importance um, to pick up on, on points that, that Tarek and Judy made of international delegations. I, I've helped to organize delegations, Palestine or Iraq, to Iran, Colombia, South Korea is to take a group of people from different directions to see a country and report back to their milieus, to their uh, 
both church and political groups and schools. It's a very important part of uh, building and sustaining a movement against U.S. wars. Now, it always raises the question of how does the anti-war movement respond in a period of endless U.S. wars? I mean, this is, this is a problem because to oppose U.S. wars, you have to explain them in the most concrete ways. At the same time, you have to know that the <coughs> corporate media won't give you a line of coverage. Their role is to support every one of these wars and do thro so through constant confusion and obstruction, just, just piling it on with demonization and horror stories. It's also a different period than earlier, let's say, thinking back to the Vietnam War, where there was a big divide even within the U.S. ruling class, within U.S. power. And part of their fighting it out was to give great publicity uh, to the movement because a, a strong part of them felt the war was unwinnable. And in fact, that was true, given the level of resistance of the Vietnamese people. But today, this is a period of in the U.S. empire of complete rot and decay. None of their wars are succeeding. They, they say it's a unipolar world. They're the only power. They decide. And yet, here we are 16 years into a war in Afghanistan, longest war, with no end in sight. They uh, received none of the gains they thought were a sure thing in Iraq or in Libya and they have been completely unsuccessful so far in Syria. And so we want to address a great deal of that war today. But we know that U.S. wars create massive destruction, both against a targeted country and in the entire region. And that needs to be addressed also. So it's a different period where the U.S. empire, what do they have to offer any country in the world? Weapons sales. That, that's it, really. How many billions of dollars will, will Saudi Arabia buy $350 billion in weapons over the next 10 years? Will it reach a trillion? I mean, really, it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite incredible. They can offer also U.S. bases. And they can offer massive destruction, assassinations, coups, sabotage, interference in the elections of every country while screaming about that there's interference here. So they have nothing to offer. And this is a real problem for the U.S. empire. They also have nothing to offer here except an assurance that everything from social security and pensions and health care and schools will be cut further and further to sustain these wars. So we're in a period where we have to address all the wars and yet address and give information on each of the wars. But we, the, the anti-war movement now does need a view of U.S. imperialism of the U.S. empire and the empire in this period, a different period. They are contracting. In economic terms, a second-rate power with a first-rate nuclear weapons, a military machine larger than the whole world combined, and a constant threat to use it. They sail their aircraft carriers, nuclear submarines, hold war games off the coast from Korea and China to the very borders of Ukraine. So the Hands Off Syria coalition was an effort to take this enormous manufactured confusion, because it doesn't happen accidentally, and hammer out a statement, a unified statement, and pull out a few facts that are so obvious. We, we passed this out earlier, this Hands Off Syria statement. It's available online, but it has thousands of signers around the world and organizational signers. It, it helped to generate a debate in many, many organizations. Would they sign this? What did it mean? Were they in agreement? And, and have a basic agreement on a few facts on Syria and a few demands on Syria. And actually, it's a very good template 
for other building opposition to other U.S. wars. So I want to raise it from that perspective, because sometimes we have to think how we handle both the concrete and have a wider view of what we're <coughs> about, and how we go about building unity among many different forces. So, as I say, we hammered out a few facts that were so obvious that this is U.S. orchestrated intervention. That was number one. That it's a U.S. demand of regime change. The government must resign. That the sanctions have destabilized not only Syria, but the entire region. It puts the whole region in a complete lockdown, creating enormous hardship. Another obvious fact, guaranteed even in the UN Charter, the government of Syria has a right to call on other countries and forces for assistance against an outside intervention. And maybe most important, it's so obvious, but it's not our business <coughs> to decide the government of Syria, to decide for or against Assad. I mean, uh, imagine saying that to the, the movement at large. It, this is the business of the people of Syria. Now, there can be different views on the government to praise it, to be in opposition, to feel it could go further, do more, do less, uh, and, and even on this panel and within the signers of Hands Off Syria. But we all agree on one point. It's not our business. It's the business of the people of Syria. So that was sort of the, the basic points of unity that we came up with. And then we came up with four basic demands. End regime change. End all foreign aggression. And the arming and the funding. End all the military and financial and logistical intervention. And end the sanctions. And then to also say the most obvious, that we <coughs> need jobs and health care and education and an end to racist police here in the U.S. and not wars and violence abroad. So that was the basis of the Hands Off Syria statement. But as I say, this could be a template for other struggles. Hands off Venezuela. Hands off the Ukraine. NATO out. Hands off Cuba and the blockade. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we could go on and on. Um, now, I also want to salute the many different kinds of actions, because very often those who are for the war or don't want to be pushed to take a stand say, well, there just aren't enough people in the streets. You haven't done enough to capture my attention. My time is almost up, so let me sort <laughs> of uh, a end on, on these points, that, that in the past six years, in terms of the war in Syria and earlier the war in Libya, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, not only delegations organized, but constantly forums, videos, meetings, coordinated forums across the country, coordinated demonstrations again and again. Sometimes we we say, well, we think we can pull this off in 25 cities where there will be at least a picket line. Other times, we've had up to 100 cities where there is a coordinated action. When the U.S. Congress was actually going to vote on uh, U.S. intervention, if you remember, it was that 2014 or 2015, there were militant delegations that went to every single congressional office in the country and said, no, don't you dare. Now, every one of these coordinated actions show what's possible. Uh, final point is that we're up against, and have been from the very beginning, uh, an enormous number of funded non-governmental organizations and media, including what's called alternative media, whose role is simply to <coughs> sow confusion, distrust, and to give the soft line of the U.S. State Department. And this is true whether we're talking about Amnesty International reports, Human Rights Watch, Democracy Now!, the Bernie Sanders campaign. Whether it's Republican or Democrat, it's Trump or Clinton or Sanders, they all agreed that the U.S. war in Syria was entirely legitimate. 
and anyone who didn't agree was somehow out of touch with reality. So we're up against a lot, even right here at Left Forum, where overwhelmingly there can be forces who are absolutely for the war and for giving every possible reason and excuse. So we have an alliance, the U.S. has an alliance of the most reactionary forces, and they're also backed up by all those who say resistance is impossible. And we have to really band together in new ways, find constant ways, and, and this, this uh, one campaign, the Hands Off Syria campaign, was a way of impacting many organizations. I would encourage everyone here to go to the website of Hands Off Syria Coalition, sign that, send it out to others, and see if it can't be the basis of having united kinds of actions, and, and actions which educate people on what the U.S. empire is today in this period of extreme decline and yet extreme ruthlessness, that our strength and our unity, our solidarity with people who are under attack around the world, we can be a material force if we understand what we're about and we do so and we act in a very conscious way. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. Point of information. Point of information. Uh, I would like to also add to Sarah's uh, information that uh, the coalition fully supports Tulsi Gabbard's uh, uh, from Hawaii um, is her bill at, the, at the Congress, um, HR 608, uh, which is uh, calling for cutting all support by the U.S. government for all terrorists everywhere, including Syria. Um, we have been trying to mobilize in support of that bill. There is a website, hr608.info, where people can go and sign the petition in support of Gabbard's bill. And that petition automatically emails it, uh, emails the petition, signed petition, your copy of it, to. Uh, 60 members of Congress who are on the Intelligence Committee and Foreign Affairs Committee. So it would be very helpful if you could take a minute and, and go on that site, hr608.info, and uh, sign the petition. <coughs> it will go to members of Congress who are considering the bill. We are certain that in those <coughs> committees the bill is going to be silenced and, and kept there on the table, but we want them to vote yes on it. So. It would help a lot. Thanks. Did you have something to add to that, Tarek? Is that what you uh, Not to that in particular, but I will say that Veterans for Peace definitely supports that bill, and we support uh, um, Tulsi, what she's calling for. And she's a lone wolf out there. Yeah. You know, so she's it's important that we. What? She's also, she's also a veteran. A rap. Yeah. I mean, we're not in total agreement with her on everything, but on these points, right. we are in agreement. I, d I did get the paper for <clears throat> another reason, uh, but I, I want to thank you guys for your presentation. It was really, um, you added so much information, it was so important. I did want to say about the, uh, about the anti-war movement in particular, about building it and unifying it. <clears throat> One of the reasons that Veterans for Peace, and I think we've all realized this, that the anti-war movement specifically in the states has dwindled is because there's so many other issues that people are struggling with. People are struggling with the oppression against black people, against immigrants, uh, the environmental destruction that's going on, the pipeline. So there's all these different issues. Well, what Veterans for Peace is doing and what a number of people are doing is connecting it because we see that what's going on here, the violence, and this is all, all of this is violence, the violence that has been in this country since the inception of the country, right, with the, with the genocidal war on Native Americans, is now exported. It doesn't come from nowhere. If I'm not a violent person, I'm not going to walk out of my house and be violent. If I'm violent inside, I'm going to be violent outside. So we see that it's all connected. So what we're trying to do now 
is to make these connections very, very prominent to show how that there is no global warming without the, mili the might of the military, without, without the backup of, of uh, armed and militarized police, National Guard, etc., private contractors who use violence. There's no such thing as, you couldn't have that. You couldn't have the oppression in the black community without militarized police, without these, these things. So everything comes back and is connected to this massive uh, organized violence, which we call U.S. military and all, all the effects that it has, all the weaponry. So I got the paper because I, I we, we have 10, we came up with 10 demands. We just had a big rally in Washington, D.C., then a march to the White House, then more at the White House. And we had 10 demands, which, you know, Veterans for Peace is an anti-war organization. I mean, our principle is end war because we think that war period is bad. But we realized some years ago that war is not just what's going on in Vietnam or what's going on in, in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, or Syria. That's not the only definition of war. Black people know war. Immigrants know war. Uh, you know, uh, refugees know war. I mean, these are all aspects of war, organized violence. So we want people to get it, that these things are all connected. Then we can come together, then we can have a powerful movement, and this is part of it. You know, the, the hands off Syria is definitely a part of it. I agree with this program. I'm just gonna take one more second, just to, just, I, I wrote these, uh, most of these uh, demands with a little bit of help, but, we, they're in the paper, and I, I, I want you to know, just think about for a minute how all of this is connected to this. It's connected, directly connected. So our first demand was, and you'll love this, you'll love this, dismantle the U.S. empire at home and abroad, because we are an occupied country. You know, we think, well, we walk around, we have freedom. No, not really. We, freedom is having a say in what your community is doing, and we don't have that. You know, so that's number one. Number two is close all U.S. bases on foreign soil, bring the troops home. That would go a long way to alleviating all these problems. Three, ban nuclear weapons. Four, redirect the Pentagon budget, money for education, healthcare, infrastructure, and sustainable green energy, the environment. Five, dismantle corporate control of our government. We see how the corp corporations are totally interfaced with the military, totally. Uh, six, dismantle the school to prison military pipeline. Seven, stop persecution of migrants, immigrants, and refugees. Eight, end sexism and gender discrimination in the military. Nine, respect and honor First Nations sovereignty and treaties. Ten, end racism and racist violence. So all of those things connect with people that are struggling for what we were calling other issues. There's not any more other issues. They're all the same issue. They're all connected, and they're connected with this. And if we can connect with people on that level, then I think we're gonna build a stronger anti-war and anti-imperialist movement, because that's what we're dealing with. Can we go into right a general discussion yeah, rather than yes. 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 Sorry. So, Hang on for one second. So, um, let me just say also that uh, Kerry Condon from Vets for Peace is on the coordinating committee of Hands Off Syria. And also I want to just put in a plug for the UNAC conference, which is called End the Wars at Home and Abroad, and has basically the same program which <laughs> Tarek just uh, laid out. And I also want to mention that I have a, a list here. If you want to get your email on the email list for Hands Off Syria Coalition, please come up and give me your email. So this is an issue, Syria, that has divided the left divided the anti-war movement. It's been a very um, uh, um, powerful discussion in some sense. You heard what people said here. Uh, we will be accused, and Hands Off Syria Coalition is continually being accused as being pro-Assad. That is what we get accused of. You heard what, what we have said here, that our focus and the title of this is U.S. intervention and leaving the, the, the aspect of what government people have to the, to the people in that country. That's called self-determination. We support the right of self-determination. 
So uh, this has engendered a lot of discussion. Let's see where it goes from here. If you have a question or discussion, please raise your hand. I'll call on you, let the folk call on a bunch, get a bunch of questions and discussion, and then we'll, we'll let the folks on the panel answer. I see one person here, two, and three. Let's start with that. And then four back there. Well, I'm just curious, you know, you always hear about, you know, American interests. They always say it's about American interests. What exactly are the American interests? Corporate interests or global, globalization? I'm just yeah, okay. curious. Um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this man here was next. Yeah. Uh, I for the question, please. Um, uh, why is it uh, very, you know, like uh, Sarah pointed out, I mean, I can relate how Syria, and this is a fact that was beautiful before uh, 2011, it's before the Zionist backed rebels came in and wreaked havoc over there and killed millions of people. Why is it that the Muslim organizations, or so called Muslim organizations, seem to support those rebels who have wreaked, wreaked havoc over there? Of course, I know why the Jewish are so called Jewish. Uh, Israel lobby supports it, but the Muslim uh, uh, organization, I mean, just like, like I'm an anti-Zionist Jew, I'm called the self-hating Jew, but these folks aren't called self-hating Muslims. I mean, I get just like APAC doesn't speak for Jews, so to the Muslim organizations in Saudi Arabia don't speak for Muslims? Can someone elaborate on that? Okay. Now, uh, one of you, who's the next person? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just to address the issue of not as much a question as um, of um, the takeover of Amnesty International and the the um, brainwashing mm -hmm. of what what used to be potentially anti-war groups that have now been co-opted. Basically, I, you know, one of my issues is cultural, and I think it goes way back to the end of World War II. And it's a it's a very specific ob objective of the U.S. to take over all forms of thought including culture and um, that it's 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 been done you know they, they've taken over the arts they've denuded the thinking I don't think we have an anti-war movement I remember the anti-war movement from the 60s and the 70s it, it disappeared uh, not completely but um, so that's that's an issue for me is the invasion of the body snatchers kind of issue with with um, you know Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and um, and and people uh, nobody talks about the wars I don't hear people I mean a la Bernie Sanders talks about free education and health care but he never linked, he never linked it up. So anyway, I think it goes back to World War II, the end of World War II, and, and the, the purposeful uh, objective of taking over all forms of thinking, culturally. Uh, thank you. Uh, men back there. Yeah, we'll thank, thank you to all the around. panelists. Uh, I just have a, one comment. About two years ago, New York City was host to a uh, photography exhibit in Chelsea. It was a photography exhibit. Um, called Ukraine, Syria, What's Next? I don't know if anyone got to see that, but it showed it showcased before and after scenes of cities like Damascus, like Aleppo, and you could really see how secular the society was. So I think that was very important for those who visited, and it brought a lot of awareness. So I want to know uh, how can we support those type of projects, because for the American public at large, it's so hard to get footage from the ground, to get reporting from the ground. We have to see RT, Al Jazeera, Telesur, you know, aside from also joining your organizations and signing petitions, but how do we get the American public at large to uh, support these projects and just bring greater award awareness to the uh, theme of imperialism that Baman mentioned, which is so important and critical in this issue. Thank you. Well, why don't we just go down the line and answer whatever you want to from the tape that people gave, and we'll do a second round after that. Questions real quick because I think you all right uh, the, f the first one was um, uh, what are US interests um, that we all hear US interests in this region or this region um, and uh, the second one was why do the, I don't know if I got down everything but points that stuck yes, out to me when people said 
why do so many Muslim organizations seem to support the rebels? And the third one is um, about uh, changing the consciousness and intervening into the consciousness of people through um, uh, Amnesty International, the Human Rights Watch, um, the arts, etc. And the third question was um, basically a, a statement about uh, an exhibit that took place on Syria and Ukraine and other places showing the secularness of the, these cities before and how can we get involved in more projects like that. Uh, and maybe each of us could keep our comments to less than five minutes, you, if yeah. you would time mm -hmm. us. I will time So we you. have mm -hmm. time for a second round yeah. of uh, okay. questions and com comments. Okay. Go on. Anybody wants to go first, or you want to go? Do you want to just go down the line and? Well, we'll go down the line this way, then we'll go down the line that way next okay. time round. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to be duplicating each other, I suppose. Well, uh, go. Maybe um, we could try not to. In terms of uh, what are national interests? Uh, well, what they present as our national interests are not the same things as our real national interests. So. They try to present their interests as the national interest. They, as they used to say before, what's good for GM is good for America. It's that's the same uh, attitude, uh, especially the more class divide deepens, uh, the less possible to define a national interest along something that, that everybody agrees on. Because one way or another, any of the policies that we are, I mean, main ones that we are involved in, any of the policies that, that, that the government or, 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 or the establishments tries to adopt, there's no way it can satisfy everybody. It's going to benefit some group and hurt some other group. And, and there's no way you can come up with a national interest issue on that. Um, even though <coughs> the issue of terrorism that everybody thinks that it's in our national interest to fight it, right? We are promoting it. There are people who are promoting this terrorism abroad, right? And in the United States. I mean, we are taking side, we are, we are, we are selling $300 billion worth of weapons to a country that is the source of a lot of terrorism in the, in the world, right? And uh, look what they're doing in Yemen right now. Or look what they did to Bahrain, right? And, and we are selling them uh, all these weapons, right? So we are promoting that, and it's in the interest of the same what Eisenhower called military-industrial complex, or I would say military-industrial security establishment complex that is going on, uh, that benefits from it. And the rest of people pay for it. So our national interest really is to go against this, this whole, the whole network that has taken over and, 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 and removed them and reorient the whole system towards something that serves everybody. I think that that would be okay. the... That should be an end of imperialism, probably. I mean, I, I'm hung up on this one. Um, we have to call for an end to U.S. imperialism. That is our national interest, I think. Brings all of us together against a small minority. I'm not sure what Muslim organizations you are referring to, whether it's in the United States you're talking about, globally you're talking about. Care. Which ones? Care. I care. 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 Yeah. Many. But yeah, we, uh, everybody doesn't have to answer every question. I think Muslim uh, Muslim people are in a bind in this country, right? The same way some people come at, I remember the ones who are opposed to, to, to Assad say, oh, go do refugee camps and everybody is talking against Assad. And I tell them, to get to that refugee camp, they should prove that they are not pro-Assad, right? Either they are really not one, or they are hiding that they are pro-Assad because they cannot say otherwise. They are waiting to get visas to come to the United States. You expect them to say that, that they are pro-Assad, right? Um, the same case happens in the, with regard to a lot of Muslims here. This is the policy of the United States. You don't want to go against it. You're going to get in trouble. U.S. is supporting the rebels, right? What are you going to do as a Muslim group here, right? To say that you're for Assad, you're going to be in big trouble, right? So they have to either be silent or, 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 or take a kind of a diplomatic position on things that uh, I'm not talking about any particular organization. I'm talking about the general point that the Muslim have 
you know, every time somebody does something, they have they have to be the first one to come out and condemn it, right? Um, this is this is the situation they're in. But As to the rest of them, minutes. I'm not an expert, okay. so I'll leave it. So to let's this. go down. Tarek, you're next. It's great. I found the question is really related. I I I want to respond to your question because I think it's very important because it involves something that's actually been going on earlier than uh, the end of uh, World War II. Got into high gear. I mean, it basically started with Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, right? Who taught, he, he realized that it was possible to uh, manipulate public thinking. And we have, this country has become absolutely, ma you gotta give credit where credit is due absolutely masterful about it. So when people talk to me about educating the public, and I understand that, you know, and, and exposing the causes and costs of war and imperialism and so forth like that, wow, you're up against it. We got little voice, you know. They have the organs, you know, the media, the, the corporate media, the TV, the entertainment industry are all pushing out uh, this propaganda, this mind control, this mind numbing stuff, brain deadening things. And most of the public, a good part of the public, has in some way, shape, or form bought into that American myth, you know, the noble cause myth, you know what that is? That everything that we do is for the good, and, it's, and they deal with the wars, like you were saying, on an individual basis. We have to go over there to fight for freedom. You know, it's bullshit. We see through it. There are some of us who ha are, have become immune to that propaganda which is mainlining uh, the American public. So I don't depend on the American public, really, because they have been too influenced. I'm not blaming them, I'm not c critical of them, it's a disease. You know, they've been too influenced by this massive, massive propaganda uh, thing, and it is, and it's in high gear now. No country, not Nazi Germany, not Stalinist Russia, has ever had anything as sophisticated as this. What I do depend upon is the choir, building the choir. You know this, that little thing, the spectrum of allies? You know, who you talk to, who you can influence, right? I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you should be, it's really simple. But I feel we have to work on building the choir from the inside out, strengthening it. We need to increase our commitment, our willingness to make sacrifices, our willingness to put ourselves on the line, not just to discuss the issues intellectually and hope that we're going to convince the public and wait for the public to come and support us. No, you've got to lead. The choir has to lead in this thing. Um, I'm losing myself here. but. Um, that's a big issue, and that affects everything, that, that propaganda that's gone on. And, and we have to do what we can to stand up for, for truth, for justice, for human rights. That's what we have to do in every case. You know, I don't know how it's going to turn out. This country's on a destructive path that's unsustainable because the national interest has always been the interest of the few and the powerful. It started out that way. These people were slaveholders. They were rich, white slaveholders. They orchestrated this stuff. We got to make it look good. They were very brilliant. You know, it wasn't a democracy back then. It has never been a democracy. Get real. You know, it has never been a democracy. I don't even want to talk about Israel because if I get started on Israel, I'm really going to go <laughs> off the edge. Okay? But, uh, you know, they're both in it together. So the national interest of this country has always been unsustainable. This is an unsustainable national interest when you are concerned with power, profit, expansion, capitalism. You know, these things are all unsustainable. I don't know if we can stop it at this point. We're headed off a cliff in many ways. I know that it's up to each one of us to stand for truth, to stand for justice, to stand for human rights, and to do whatever we can at whatever cost it is to us as individuals. We have to stand together, we have to band together. I don't have any grand plan of how to, you know, b build a mass movement. I'm interested in Veterans for Peace, I'm interested in people who are, who are dedicated, who are willing to sacrifice, I'm interested in the choir, building a powerful, powerful choir that will do whatever is necessary to stand up for these things. You know, I guess that's my two cents. Sarah. 
hard to top both of these. Uh, really excellent. The corporate media is really linked to the military industries and to the banks. And their role is to promote and justify and, and raise up the views of U.S. power. And their role is also to marginalize and make all forms of resistance seem irrelevant. They're just not on the agenda. I mean, just think of the past period where you had tens of thousands of people who camped for months at Standing Rock. I mean, that was incredible. I, when I went, I, it was like there was no end to the, uh, and under the most difficult conditions. You had tens of thousands of people in the streets in the Black Lives Matter movement. Incredible, shut down cities, highways, re and yet almost not reported, and zero cops who have served time for point blank range killings. The media won't tell you these things. You get a little, little tiny piece. There's, there's tens of thousands of people who have acted in defense of immigrants. People who just in Portland last week, three people actually, right. you know, to, to stand up. That's, that's kind of incredible. But also when you look at the actions around the airports and so many other actions, you have a reactionary completely reactionary government and all kinds of resistance, but you won't see it in the media. So if you're looking for it in the media, you will be disappointed and you will think yourself to be irrelevant. Doesn't mean you are. It really doesn't mean mm. you are. We are having a bigger impact than I think we take credit for sometimes and which is seen much more around the world. There's international coverage of our actions mm. <laughs> and coverage in social media. Now, this is also a time where, in recent polls, less than 25% of the population in the U.S. believes the media. That's kind of interesting. And, and is more interested, among the younger generation, in creating their own media. Now, there's a certain buy-in to some of the lies, but we have more opportunities today. And I think we really have to look at what we're capable of mm -hmm. and what we're doing and not see ourselves, resist it. It's like looking at yourself in the, in the mirror of a, of a fun house, you know, where everything is all distorted. That's the role of the media, to glorify their power, including, let's say, Saudi Arabia. Now the U.S. is in an alliance at the hip with Saudi Arabia. They, it's, it's, it's like, a huge suction pump to take the money, the vast sums of money, just turn it into weapon sales. You have 25% of the population of Saudi Arabia living in extreme poverty, extreme poverty, and a completely, um, well, I, I won't even go into no women's rights, no rights for anyone, and yet there is a real all-out effort to fund uh, Muslim organizations that have a completely reactionary program and that seem to speak for the Muslim world. And that, again, is not true because there has, this has been 60 years of enormous resistance to U.S. imperialism coming from throughout the Arab and Muslim world. So it's an effort to cover and paper that over using enormous wealth and privilege. So, and, and that privilege is becoming narrower and narrower. When they say today that 60 billionaires own more than half the world, and I, I think that's even shrunk to, yeah, it was 200 and then it was 60. I, I think the latest figures are even smaller. But uh, the concentration of extreme wealth and the greatest poverty in human history, it's unsustainable. So we have to like know that and know our own capacity for change and know that the corporate media exists to lie, and they have sucked in. It's very true, uh, the point of, uh, it, it's a takeover of all forms of thought. So that's the role of Human Rights Watch and, and Amnesty International is through enormous corporate funding. They, they may have 10,000 projects that local people do, and then a few projects that get all the media coverage, which will be used to justify war, to thank NATO for intervention in Afghanistan and to justify Syria and so on. And a lot of, okay, 
my time is up, so I'll, I'll end okay. there and pass it on. Judy. Yes, more hard acts to follow. Um, I guess i just frame it in my own mindset. But uh, I, I, one thing I study to some degree is just the uh, kinds of effects the media has on people. Um, for one thing, uh, it builds fear. So people are hemmed in between fear and ignorance. And they're actually, I think, in many cases, afraid to know. Because uh, if they know, they can't turn away from it. Once you know, you can't not know. You can't say, oh, gee, I just saw this mass slaughter and I think I'm going to forget about it. No. Once you actually let yourself see it, you're stuck. And you have to resist. And people, people don't, you know, they don't want to... Uh, give in to that because it's it's frightening. It's like take the red pill in the matrix. Once you do that, the world looks a lot crummier <laughs> than it did before. But people are desperately struggling to hold on to their illusions right now. I uh, and I think that this is going to continue to crumble because of that. Um, I also think that um, these Muslims again, Muslims even more so. As uh, Bauman said, they are afraid. They're afraid to like voice any support for something against America. Even some of the really strong activists I know are often um, like they don't talk about Syria for one thing because it's just too hot to handle. And at the same time, um, they are the United States is promoting it as a bullhorn, promoting Saudi values promoting of all things, if you can even call them values. Well, they are values, but they're not uh, more, very moral by our standards. But this is, this is, and it's done not only here, but it's done in the world at large. So that, uh, say, uh, the Saudis with uh, U.S. support are building schools. This is something they're very upset about in Syria, actually, the, the government and the, and the people who are part of civil society. They're the business leaders I met. Uh, the Grand Mufti, when I talked to him, all these people are horrified because what happens is Saudi Arabia comes and they dump a whole lot of money into these mosques in poorer sections of the country. And that money goes to uh, teaching people, teaching children, but teaching people in general that the way to be well is through this narrow view of the world. Uh, and that's how you create the sectarian view. Is, and they did it in Afghanistan, it was well known. And uh, my friend from Pakistan actually had, uh, she was the first person who showed a picture of the Taliban textbooks that were made and that were uh, published in uh, by the University of Nevada uh, and this is you know this is how you know the United States permeates this whole thing uh, because sure we get the Saudis to spend the money we give it to them to spend so it won't be our our responsibility you know uh, and uh, this is this is the whole game, and you know I always come to think in my mind that this is similar to the Native Americans, to the to the conquest of the Native Americans in this country, because they got the tribes that were willing to fight alongside them to be their proxies in wars against the tribes that weren't, and then when there was no one left, they took them out because there was no one else to defend them. And uh, I think we have to really watch this. And I just want to spend one minute on the gentleman in the back corner's point. I love projects like this. I, I honestly, I don't know how powerful, but I think it's a basic part of education. It's like Tea in the Axis of Evil, the film I cited. And there's more stuff like that out there. The question is, how do we promote it? And these are the things, we can promote them through the Unitarian churches and the Presbyterians, and we can promote them through the, uh, um, all kinds of venues that don't want to hear our politics. And I think we do need to be doing that. And one of the most important things, I've been to Iran, Pakistan, uh, I've talked to people in Waziristan uh, about how, and you know what they did? They were standing in front of us chanting, we want peace, we want peace in Waziristan. Is that what we hear about Waziristan? No. You know, uh, and so we have this information and we need to send more people over because everyone who goes gets radicalized. 
and we need to make sure that there's youth among the people go because a lot of times us old people happen to have a little bit of money left and retired and we say oh well you know so we can do that but we need to get the young people over there as well and see what's really happening in these places because it's so impressive and you go away and you never believe the lies again once you've been to Iran and see what they're building to see that their military yes they have conscripts at 18 everybody has to go in the military unless they're in college does this sound familiar to us Vietnam era people but you know what while they're there doing their two years they work as firemen they work as security guards they work at, in all kinds of public jobs kind of like AmeriCorps digging wells whatever now the US has never come you know and so this gives them a peace mission and so the money isn't all being dumped into war they're actually thinking about peace so I really think that uh, we should learn more from these countries and it's very hard I, I tried to talk about they're all into about reconciliation and uh, uh, I forget what it's called, but working with people to have private solutions for violence and so on. And, uh, but you can't talk to them about the Middle East where they've been doing it forever. In fact, the very name for it is a pejorative. It's uh, de uh, Dia. And they go, oh, blood money, horrible thing. But they actually have special courts where people can sit down and have a powwow and decide how to resolve the problem. What do you really want most? to end the violence so that you won't be mad anymore. And usually it's not seeing that person executed, it's something else. So uh, I think we could learn from them. Uh, if you uh, watch the films that have been winning in Hollywood, this is a very weird thing. They've been winning Best Foreign Film by the same director. Uh, and these films always center on that private negotiation in Iranian courts where people come and they actually tell the truth. You don't tell the truth to the authorities. You tell it to one another. So uh, I want us to learn more from them. Thank you. Okay, we'll go around with the second round. Just let me say the guy in the back with the photographs. UNAC did sponsor a national tour of photographs from Ukraine on what happened at the House of Labor uh, trade unions and, and the rise of fascism that's going there. And we would love to do more projects like that. If you want to do those kinds of projects, I urge you to get involved with UNAC and uh, help us do that. So, that's, okay, I have one, because this man's been working, he should be <laughs> kind of thing, two, three, four, and five. And please try to keep it, I'm sorry, no. and let's tr please try to keep it short. So, and then we'll, uh, questions will be short. We said five minutes before, we'll go for two this time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm not so sure that the United States is such a failure in its uh, goals in the, in the Middle East. I think one of our goals is to break up these countries. Like, I, I, maybe you've heard of the Yidan plan. It's, you know, to create a lot of, break up Syria into pieces, break up Iraq into pieces. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to do. In Afghanistan, they have poppies, and we want to sell dope. You know, I've, I've heard this, and so, we, you know, the taxpayer pays for the war, and the dope dealers, whoever they are, CIA is involved, they, they get the dope money. And also, they have tons of lithium. I think we'll be in uh, Afghanistan for the next hundred years until they run out of all these things, you know, if it, if it ever happens. So, my, so, I don't know, I'd like you to respond. Is it, are we such a failure if you could consider the goals of the of the one percent. Yes. yes. Um, I belong to Peace Action, and a couple years ago, I marched in the Veterans Day Parade with Vets for Peace, and we were a small contingent, and there was a group of women from Pax Christi in Long Island. Also, I'm not a vet, but I marched for my father, who was in World War II, and um, I thought people on the sidewalk and in the reviewing stand would jeer us because we had anti-war signs and we were chanting anti-war slogans and. Behind us were tanks and little Boy Scouts singing from the walls of the halls of Montezuma. So it was very militaristic, except for our group. But um, people on the sidewalk and their viewing stand, they, che they clapped for us and cheered. I mean, maybe they didn't understand what we were. But uh, I wanted to ask Vets for Peace if they could encourage more people to march with them on Veterans Day, because look who they're experience. reacting. 
Thank you. You are next. Yes. Hi, I'm a, I'm living in Afghanistan, um, and so that's sort of the framework that I bring to the Syria question, which um, I'm just starting to learn about. And I guess I wanted to ask you guys how you see the war ending. And as a corollary to that, the two things that I'm trying, I'm struggling with and trying to figure out is this question of, though the civil war began as a, an uprising, um, and so how do we honor the demands of the public from the early era of the conflict? And then um, what do we do about the subsequent um, government sanctioned violence that we have seen? How do we address those two questions um, as we envision how the war ends? Okay. Who next? I'm Jan Weinberg. I'm the founder of Show Up America, and I organize with the Peace Action Coalition. In terms of messaging for us, for peace movement, anti-war movement, in the near future, the United States military is going to be embroiled in similar police actions, because they're not going to call it war, in the Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, and Indonesia, because of what they're calling militants and Islamic fundamental terrorism there, but our military is already deployed there. We're going to have a duplicate of what's going on in the Middle East. If we prepare the public for that information, once those incursions begin, then we're going to have a lot of credibility because the American public will absolutely flip out that we're going to be at war in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think, uh, Sarah, you had some something more to share about the finding of those organizations when you were cut off. If that's the case, I'd like to hear the details because it's, it's quite puzzling how vocal those organizations are in terms of supporting wars, and uh, I'm curious as to what exactly is driving that material support. And also, in terms of U.S. interests, it seems like, you know, the, there are many answers, but one of the main ones is profits, you know, the, the military companies and Halliburton who goes in to build, rebuild bridges, to rebuild things that have been destroyed by the military. Um, so profits are driving it. Uh, like I was thinking about that bombing that they did of the, of the uh, Soviet base or Syrian base there. It seemed like it sort of like a release valve. Everybody was so happy, oh, we bombed the, uh, and there were a few casualties from what I understand. So I wonder, I know that in, the inherent problem is imperialism, and, and as long as we have imperialism, it's not going to end. But in terms of, like, in the short run, in the temporary uh, uh, time span, is it possible to think of ways to rechannel that drive for profits where it causes fewer deaths? Like, for example, give them a target range or something where they can bomb things. They drop a $5 million bomb, and they say, we need another $5 million bomb, and nobody dies. <laughs> That's, uh, that's a cynical view, but I wonder if there's any practical... I think we have one more here. Was this man here? Uh, right. Um, some people on the left here in America, I guess, uh, have asserted or alleged that um, the West's primary interest, the reason for the fanatical interest of the United States has a lot to do with a proposed hypothetical, maybe it's more than hypothetical, pipeline between Qatar, the one from Qatar through Saudi Arabia, through Jordan, and hypothetically through Syria, and that the, the hitch there is that Assad will not sign off on the pipeline, the construction of the pipeline. Ergo, get rid of the Assad, replace him with a puppet, sign for uh, rights for the uh, pipeline, and everybody will be happy. I think it ends in Turkey. How much of that is true? Have you ever heard of this? Is this something you can confirm or debunk? Okay, let's just start with duty, go down, and keep it very short. If we don't answer all the questions, maybe uh, someone on the panel can take them. One more shot to answer a question that has been left unanswered. Mm, okay. Uh, I'm just going to quickly say, first of all, I'm going to start with the gentleman at the end because my memory is getting overwhelmed at this point. And I personally don't buy the pipeline theory, except that I think the pipeline is the cheese in the mouse trap. Uh, yeah. That the U.S. is buying off Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and uh, Qatar, and all those countries as our proxies to fight this war against Syria. And it's actually amazing that Syria has actually stood to this. I mean, no, everyone else has fallen, Assad, and I mean, not Assad, um, Gaddafi and uh, Saddam Hussein and them. 
uh, they have been unable to, the, the countries have not had uh, deep enough roots to their governments to survive it. And I think that's one of the reasons why you might say that Assad isn't the point. The point is that the entire Syrian uh, infrastructures of civil society is is strong and which is kind of interesting because in America they'll often say there's no civil society in Syria um, but I certainly saw there was and it's very powerful um, like I say I think that uh, the pipelines are cheese in a mouse trap I think that everywhere you go that the money is moving around but there'd be money moving around no matter what the mo it's about power it's about power and uh, because money has no value past a certain point, really. It, it's just moving, weighting the scale in different ways. Uh, so um, I'm going to, uh, I guess, just stick with that one point and hope that people see it as important uh, and briefly say that the PNAC and the ENON plan uh, uh, are the same that uh, uh, Bauman was talking about. And that the point isn't that we are succeeding in destroying them. The point is, we are also destroying ourselves. And I hate to use the term we. The United States government, empire, is also destroying itself. And these future wars in Asia, I think, are going to be less and less successful because the strength and solidarity of Syria is going to carry on. And these other countries are not going to be so easy to sabotage, at least not all of them. And I'd say Philippines is on the list of ones that's going to hold on and fight. So thank Sarah. you. Sarah. Let me turn that off. That was good. Okay. Um, I want to go back to sort of where we are on a, on a global scale in this point about the U.S. is losing its grip and, and um, its alliances are also. Now today, there's an Israeli day parade. We could think back to the time a few decades ago when this was an enormous event. More than a million people would turn out. And there was a, a great deal of identification with Israel and everything that it, it stood for. And it, it represented US interests in the region. It has so lost its hold today that, that they have to fly in like high school bands from around the country with an all expense paid weekend to get people to take part in their parade. And the resistance against it, there are all kinds of Palestinian and other youth today who are out there uh, demonstrating. So it's, it's important to sort of see in terms of the very ideas. Now, um, very important uh, question there. Isn't, isn't this complete disarray and breakup of uh, so many countries part of the U.S. plan? Uh, yes, it is. But unless it provides a new source of profit, it's a complete failure. And just uh, deciding to be picking through a scrap heap, being rag pickers, is not enough profit to keep the U.S. empire afloat. So they are able to totally destroy countries and pull them apart. But that doesn't mean that they even got the, the new sources of, of profit that was part of the aim of the war. Now, selling the weapons, that's profitable. But we, we really do need to understand that this is uh, an empire in, in enormous decline, and it's no longer profitable. I mean, a growth rate of, of you know, less than 1%, that's, that's a big problem for them. So now, um, just trying to answer, touch, touch on a few things asked about um, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and a lot of the alternative media and, and forces here. The, the purpose of funding from the Ford Foundation and Soros and Rockefeller and, and AID funding and whatnot uh, is to, to provide a, a social reality, a social construct of where groups all seem to be talking to each other. They have staffs, they're linked into the corporate media, uh, but it, it really is to support U.S. war and U.S. aims and, and to justify they do the same thing now with even the purpose of what was the United Nations at one time and the way it exists now. So. 
money talks. Is that a surprise? I, I don't think that it is, but it, it gives the illusion constantly that this represents uh, civil society, as it's called. And they're able to do this on a vast scale. When they brag that, that $5 billion and was it 4,000 NGOs were set up in the Ukraine to carry out the coup and the overturn. And they bragged about this. Assistant Secretary of State was, was on tape saying how well they had done in creating a complete fabrication to overthrow a government, and it was to bring NATO uh, in to right to the borders of Russia. So this is the way their, their wars are carried out. Uh, and they put a great deal of, of resources into it. Um, uh, all right, all right. Um, how's it going to end? <laughs> you know, is sort of the the question. H how? Where is all of this going? It's it's on a deep slide down. It's on a deep slide down. Mm -hmm. But they're losing their hold also on the population here. The population around the world. It, you can't just do it with troops, whether it's in the Philippines. Look at this, look at the, both the uh, vote in the Philippines and in South Korea, where they put in whole new THAAD missile batteries, and, and then they had a real pushback. So they can't carry out, even in the places they thought were totally secure, their aims, and they can't sell it here. Uh, Trump is a good example of the complete decay of the two-party system right here and now, and, and it, it's losing its hold on the population here. So we need to plan for resistance and know that there are points where things break and, and what we're saying can resonate. So, so let's keep our eye on that. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sarah. That was really good. Uh, yeah, the U.S. empire is in decline, and it's, like I said, it's not sustainable, and it won't be sustained. A um, couple of things I wanted to talk about. Thank you for bringing that up about the marches, the Veterans for Peace marches, because it is true that most people want peace. Most people want peace. They may not be educated about it. They may, they may be influenced by other sources, but when they see the the, peace, the veterans marching for peace, yeah, we do get applause, and I would like to encourage more people to march with us. That's, that's good. That's one aspect. The other thing uh, you spoke about, uh, what's going on in the Pacific, in Asia. Well, we are talking about that. People are talking about that. Uh, Bruce Gagnon from Global Network addresses that a lot. I've spent time in South Korea and Okinawa uh, with people that are very aware of that. And there is a global, I don't want to say network, but there's a global uprising of people all over, and I've seen it in, in places other than the U.S., where people are standing up to U.S. militarism and U.S. imperialism. You know, so that, that, that circle is, it's important for us to connect with that and, and realize that we are part of a larger whole. It's not just here in the U.S., but we're part of a global resistance. And that's maybe the only chance we have, you know. Uh, but we're aware of the Pacific pivot, and people are resisting it and educating about it. And yeah, that is the next uh, focus, you know, that we will see wars uh, all over the place. And uh, it might help if people are forewarned and uh, forearmed. Um, I don't know what else. What? But you could cut into my two minutes. <laughs> I only have two minutes. <laughs> Whatever. Thank Go you. ahead. Uh, I guess everybody covered yeah, almost everything. Did, yeah. I don't know much. <laughs> Except one suggestion you made that why don't you give them a, a bombing field and, and let them blow up the weapons they have. The problem is that, the first of all, U.S. interest is not the same as national interests of the United States. When we talk about U.S. interests, you're talking about this ruling class, the, the empire, and that is being presented as the national interest of the United States people. Okay, these are two separate things. And you cannot shrink it to profit because that profit needs military support to be guaranteed. 
right? If they just blow up their bombs in a field and let all the resistance that's going on around the world to grow, they're going to be losing the whole thing. So you cannot reduce the U.S. imperialism into its military side only, okay? It is the economic side that supports, backs up the military because military operation is not a productive but a destructive process, right? So in a sense, they have to draw from the economy and the strength of the military depends on the strength of the economy. And as Sarah said, it's going down. And at the same time, the resistance is growing around the world, right? So we, we, we have to expect a lot of more desperately violent responses from the United States soon from two various areas of the world, I think. It's a strategic issue. So uh, before you leave, if you'd like to get on the Hands Off Syria Coalition email list, come up and put your email here. I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I'd like to again remind you the UNAC conference where a lot of the leadership of the social justice and anti-war movement will be because the solution that the people are asking for is within you. And we have to come together and we have to discuss these things. There's no silver bullet. But together we're gonna we're gonna win this. Thank you.